we've been looking at convergence of probability distributions. Last time, we considered total variation convergence, which is a nice uniform type of convergence for probability measures. The problem with it is, uniform type convergence is often too strong for the kinds of problems we're interested in. Let's look at a few examples. Consider a sequence an of real numbers that converges to a real number a. Surely it should be true that the point mass at an converges as a measure to the point mass at a. Is that true? Well, let's think about total variation convergence. The total variation distance between those two measures is the supremum over all Borel sets of the difference between delta an of b and delta a of b. Well, that's certainly bounded below by taking b equal to the singleton set a. And here's the rub. This term here is equal to zero unless a n is actually equal to a. So we get that this is zero while this is constantly one, and this distance is bounded below by the maximum possible value for total variation distance between probability measures, one, for arbitrarily large n, unless a n happens to be eventually constantly equal to n. So unless we want our notion of convergence of sequences to just be eventually constant, we get that total variation distance between these measures does not coincide with our notion of convergence of real numbers. That's a bummer. And what it demonstrates is an important fact which usually rules out total variation convergence for our considerations. If mu and nu are any two probability measures that are mutually singular, meaning that there exists an event A for which mu of A is zero, while nu of A is one, then the total variation distance between them has got to be one because it's bounded below by mu of A minus nu of A in absolute value, and that's one. That fact rules out the following kind of discrete approximation that we'd really like to use for probability distributions. Take, for example, the uniform distribution on the unit interval. Here is a natural discrete approximation of it. Take a bar graph with bars at points 1 over n, 2 over n, 3 over n. In other words, take point masses, each of mass 1 over n, and put them at 1 over n, 2 over n, 3 over n, all the way up to n over n. You would hope that this is a good approximation in some nice sense of the uniform distribution, but because this is a discrete measure, it's mutually singular from this one. This one gives total mass to a finite set of points, and this one gives mass zero to any finite set of points. And so that says that mu n and the uniform distribution have total variation distance equal to one, and so in total variation, this is a maximally bad approximation of this distribution. Does that mean that our intuition that this should be a good approximation of this measure is wrong? No, it means that our notion of convergence is wrong for most applications. To get an idea what kind of weaker convergence of probability measures we really want to use, let's examine this example a little more closely. Why is it we think that that discrete approximation should approximate that measure? Consider that total variation distance controls not only the distance between the measures of sets, but also the distance between integrals of bounded functions, as we showed last time. The integral of a bounded measurable function against mu differs from the integral of that same bounded measurable function against nu by an amount controlled by the supremum of that bounded function and the total variation distance. That means in particular that if I have a sequence of measures that converges in total variation, then the integral of any test function, which is a bounded measurable function against mu n, converges to the integral of that same test function against mu. Now let's look at this integral in the case where mu is our discrete approximating measure here. Of course, that's just equal to this sum and we should recognize this sum as a Riemann sum. It is in fact a Riemann sum for the Lebesgue integral of h on the unit interval, which is of course the integral against the uniform measure. If our test function h therefore were actually Riemann integrable, 
then this desired convergence would hold with this discrete approximating measure. Now we know that this sequence of measures does not converge in total variation to the uniform distribution, but maybe that doesn't mean that this convergence can't hold even for arbitrary bounded measurable functions here. Indeed, this notion of convergence is weaker than this notion in general. These two are equivalent for discrete measures, as we saw in a previous lecture, but you'll show on a future homework that this is weaker than this. Nevertheless, we cannot take an arbitrary bounded measurable function here. For example, if we were to take h equal to the indicator of the rationals in the unit interval, well then, taking h at any of the points in the point masses in this discrete measure, which are all rational numbers, we just get the value 1, which means that the integral of h against that discrete approximating measure mu n is constantly equal to 1. However, the integral of h against the uniform measure, against the Lebesgue measure, is 0, as we've seen before. And so this does not hold for all bounded measurable functions, but it does hold for Riemann integrable functions. So maybe that's what we should do. We should take this as our definition of convergence of measures, but we restrict the allowed test functions to be Riemann integrable. And that is close to what we will do, but will actually be even a little more restrictive. And say the following. Consider any metric space S and take any sequence of Borel probability measures on S and a putative limit Borel probability measure on S. We say that mu n converges weakly to mu or converges in distribution to mu written like this or like this if the integral of any continuous bounded test function against mu n converges to the integral of that continuous bounded test function against the putative limit measure mu. Now, if we were thinking functional analytically, we would call this notion weak star convergence because it is dualizing the convergence in this space by recognizing measures as the dual space to that one. But we don't need that highfalutin terminology. This is our definition of weak convergence of probability measures and it is the notion that we will be working with for the next several weeks. Now, we saw here that this notion fixes our problem with the intuition of this being a discrete approximation of the uniform measure. What about our other counterintuitive example? Take any sequence of real numbers converging to a real number A. Then, of course, by the definition of continuity, if f is any continuous function, f of an converges to f at a but f at a n is the integral of f against the point mass delta of a n, and f of a is the integral of f against the point mass delta of a. And so we do see that the point mass delta of a n does converge weakly to the point mass at a. So we can have weak convergence even when we don't have total variation convergence. We do always have weak convergence when we do have total variation convergence. Weak convergence is strictly weaker than total variation convergence, as we have right here. And that's simply because, as we showed, total variation distance going to zero implies that the integral of h d mu n converges to the integral of h d mu for all bounded measurable functions h, and those include continuous bounded functions. So we can compare weak convergence to total variation convergence. Intuitively here, what we're doing is by taking only continuous test functions, we are allowing them in these integrals to smear out the measure a little bit, which is why they can provide for discrete approximations of continuous measures. Now, just as with total variation convergence, we will import the idea to random variables as well. If I have a sequence of random variables xn and a putative limit random variable all taking values in the same metric space S, then we say that Xn converges weakly to X if and only if the law of Xn converges weakly to the law of X. Since this is a notion that depends only on the laws of the random variable separately, we don't even care if these are defined on the same probability space for this to make sense. 
However, if they are defined on the same probability space, we can then try to compare this notion, weak convergence, to all the previous notions of convergence of random variables, almost sure, LP, and convergence in probability. Well, the result is that even the weakest among those, convergence in probability, is still stronger than weak convergence. If xn is a sequence of random variables, and x is another random variable, all defined on the same probability space, taking values in the same metric space, then if xn converges in probability to p, xn also converges weakly to p. In order to prove this, we need to first prove the following lemma, which we could have proved long ago when we introduced convergence in probability. Suppose that xn converges in probability to x, and g is any continuous function in the state space s where they take values, then g of xn converges in probability to g of x. This is a property that holds true almost obviously for almost sure convergence. It is false for LP convergence in general, and it turns out that it holds true for convergence in probability. That's a little bit tricky to prove. Let's do so now. Fix any positive epsilon and delta then we can look at the following kind of variant of the modulus of continuity of the function g. That is, b of epsilon and delta of g consists of all of those points x in the domain of g in the metric space for which there is some nearby point y, delta nearby in particular, that gets mapped by g far away from g of x. That is, so that the distance between g of x and g of y is bigger than epsilon. Now continuity of g is precisely the statement that for any fixed epsilon, this set of nearby points that get thrown far away decreases to the empty set as delta goes to zero. We can use that to prove our lemma as follows. For fixed epsilon, consider the set where g of xn and g of x differ in absolute value by more than epsilon. Per this definition, that is contained in the set where either xn and x are delta far away from each other, or x is in this set b epsilon delta of g. Indeed, if this fails to be true, then this condition here tells us that xn can be taken as the y in this definition. So that means that the probability of this event is less than or equal to the sum for any delta positive. Let's look at this second term first. By the change of variables theorem, this is the law of x at the event b epsilon delta. Now, as our parameter delta gets smaller and smaller, this set shrinks down to the empty set. And since this is a probability measure, that means that this goes to zero. So that means that we can make this probability as small as we like by choosing delta sufficiently small. So if we have some other parameter, eta greater than zero, by choosing delta sufficiently small, we can make this less than, say, eta over two. Now, once we've chosen that delta, we just note that by our assumption, xn converges to x in probability, which is precisely the statement that for any delta, this goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And so we can choose n large enough that this is also less than, say, eta over two. Thus, we can choose for any eta greater than zero, n large enough that this is less than eta for all subsequent n's, which is precisely the statement that g of xn converges to g of x in probability. Now we can prove our proposition. Let's begin by noting that the integral of the test function f against the law of xn is, by the change of variables theorem, the expected value of f at xn. Now by assumption, xn converges in probability to x, and therefore, because f is a continuous function here, by the previous lemma, f at xn converges in probability to f at x. Now we also have, because we're only allowing bounded test functions, that f is uniformly bounded. So f at xn 
is less than or equal to some constant m, or all n. And therefore, by the dominated convergence theorem, to be precise, the version of the dominated convergence theorem that only requires convergence in probability for the underlying functions, it follows that f at xn converges to f at x in L1. And in particular, the expected value of f at xn converges to the expected value of f at x. But by the change of variables theorem, that is the integral of f against mu x, and therefore we have concluded that xn converges to x weakly. Now, since both almost sure convergence and LP convergence imply convergence in probability, we also see that almost sure or LP convergence imply weak convergence. So this new notion of convergence fits into the hierarchy of convergence notions, and it allows for convergence in many cases where the other ones do not. Let's think a little bit more about why. What really went wrong in the example for point mass at a n trying to converge to a point mass at the limit a of the sequence a n? The problem is that total variation distance is just too sensitive to jumps. It's too sensitive to discontinuity sets. Let's be precise about what that means. Let mu be a Borel measure on any metric space, in fact any topological space will do here. An event, that is a Borel set, is called a continuity set for that measure mu if the measure of the boundary of that set is zero. So remember, the boundary of a set in a topological space is the closure of that set minus the interior of that set. And so we can equivalently call a set A a continuity set if the measure of A is the same as the measure of its closure is the same as the measure of its interior. So the issue before with total variation distance had to do with the fact that the interval from minus infinity up to A closed is not a continuity set for the point mass at A. Indeed, the point mass at the boundary of that interval, which is precisely the singleton A, is one, not zero. Now here's a feature that's going to be important in some future lectures. Suppose that we have a Borel probability measure on the real line. We know that those are determined by their cumulative distribution functions. If the CDF of that measure is a continuous function, if we have what was referred to as a continuous random variable in undergraduate probability, meaning precisely that the measure assigns no mass to any singleton point, then all intervals are continuity sets for that set mu, because the boundary of an interval is always a collection of 0, 1, or 2 points. However, be warned, not all sets are continuity sets even in this setting, and we've already seen such an example. The rationals in the unit interval is not a continuity set for the Lebesgue measure. Indeed, the boundary of that set, which is its closure minus its interior, is just the full unit interval, since the rationals are dense in here, but have empty interior. But the Lebesgue measure of this set is certainly not zero. Now with that in hand, we can start to look at set-wise equivalence of weak convergence. Our next theorem, one of the major theorems about weak convergence, is called the portmanteau theorem. And here's what it says. If we have a complete separable metric space, like Euclidean space for example, and we have a sequence of Borel probability measures on that metric space, together with a putative limit Borel probability measure, then the following conditions are equivalent. The first is that mu n converges weakly to mu by our definition. That is, if I test it against continuous bounded functions, I get convergence of the integrals. It turns out that we don't need to test it against all continuous bounded functions. It's good enough to test it only against bounded Lipschitz functions. We can also just test the measures themselves against some events. That is, all we need to do is check that 
for all closed subsets, mu n of that closed subset f has lim sup less than or equal to the putative limit, mu of f. It's also equivalent just to check that for any open set, g, the limit inf of mu n of g is greater than or equal to the putative limit, mu of g. And finally, the most important equivalent notion which we get by summarizing the last two is that weak convergence of mu n to mu is equivalent to setwise convergence, mu n of a converging to mu of a, but not for all sets, that's too strong, rather only for mu continuous sets, Borel sets for which the putative limit mu assigns zero measure to the boundary. We're going to prove this now, but first let's take a moment to discuss the name. Why is it called the portmanteau theorem? You may be aware that portmanteau is a word which means a word formed by combining two words. The standard example being brunch for breakfast and lunch, but here are some other fun ones you may have not thought about as being portmanteaus. Internet is a portmanteau for international network. Meld is a portmanteau of melt and weld. Smog comes from smoke and fog. Chortle comes from chuckle and snort. But what does that have to do with this theorem? Well, where did the word portmanteau come from? It's an old English word which referred to a hard leather case that opens up in halves, much the way that modern suitcases do. And so the name of this theorem simply comes from the fact that it has so many different looking parts that it's really just a bag of tricks for weak convergence of probability measures. Let's see why all of these tricks in the bag are equivalent. To go from one to two, that is, weak convergence to convergence by testing against Lipschitz functions is the immediate observation that Lipschitz functions are continuous. Now, suppose that we only know that we get convergence when testing against Lipschitz functions. We'd like to conclude that the lim sup of mu n of any closed set is less than or equal to mu of that closed set. To do so, we introduce the following kind of continuous cutoff function. Psi is the function on the real line, which is one on the negative real axis, zero after one, and is piecewise linear in between, that is, it's one minus t in between. This function is a bounded Lipschitz function. Why is it Lipschitz? Well, because it's differentiable almost everywhere and its derivative is less than or equal to one there. Therefore, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, it's Lipschitz and its Lipschitz norm is less than or equal to one. Now fix our favorite closed set F in our metric space S, and consider the functions fk for any positive integer k given by fk of x is psi, this cutoff function, of k times the distance between x and f. To be clear here, the distance between a point and a set is defined to be the infimum over the whole set of the distance between x and points in that set. And that as you can easily check, is itself a Lipschitz function with Lipschitz norm one. So that means from the definition that if I look at the distance between fk of x and fk of y for any two points in the metric space, that's less than or equal to k times the distance between x and f and the distance between y and f, just from psi being a lip one function. But since this is also a lip one function. That means that this will be less than or equal to k times the distance between x and y. And so that says that fk is a Lipschitz function on the whole metric space. Also, since psi is less than or equal to one, fk is less than or equal to one. And so we've shown that fk is a bounded Lipschitz function the kind that under assumption two, we're allowed to integrate against and get the right limit. That is for fixed k, the integral of fk against mu n converges to the integral of fk against mu. Now we're gonna take k to infinity. Notice that if x 
has some positive distance away from the set f, then fk of x from here decreases, because psi is a decreasing function, to psi at infinity, which is just zero. On the other hand, if x has no distance away from f, then fk of x is just constantly equal to psi of zero, which is one. And so that is to say, fk decreases to the indicator function of the set of points that have no distance from f, which is just the closure of f. But our assumption was that f was closed, and so fk is a nice monotone approximation of the indicator function of f. That's why we introduced it. And therefore, if I take the limb soup of mu n of f, which is the same thing as the limb soup of the integral of indicator of f against d mu, because this is decreasing, that will be less than or equal to the limb soup of the integral of fk against d mu n. But as we established here, that limit actually exists and is equal to the integral of fk against d mu. But again, because the fk are decreasing and non-negative, or because they are bounded above by one, we can use either the monotone convergence theorem or the dominated convergence theorem to show that this integral decreases to the integral of the indicator of f, the limit of the fk's against mu, which is mu of f. And that establishes three. Now let's see that three and four are actually equivalent to each other. Remember, part four is similar to part three, except we're talking about a limb inf and open sets instead of a limb soup and closed sets. But if g is an open set, we can then take one minus the limb inf of mu n of g. That's the same thing as the limb soup of one minus mu n of g. But one minus mu n of g is mu n of g complement. g complement is closed because g is open. And so by the assumption of three, this will be less than or equal to mu of g complement, which is one minus mu of g. And then taking away those one minuses, we get the right inequality between this and this as needed, establishing four. The converse going back from four to three is almost word by word identical. And so we get that these two are equivalent. Now we wanna see that either one of those implies 0.5, which is our most interesting one, that weak convergence implies setwise convergence for mu continuous sets. Well, suppose that we start with a mu continuous set, that is the measure of the boundary of that set with respect to the limit measure mu is zero, meaning again that the measure of A is the same as the measure of A closure, is the same as the measure of the interior of A. Well then, mu n of A will be less than or equal to mu n of a closure, since a is contained in a closure, and therefore the limb soup is less than or equal to the limb soup, but by assumption of three, that's less than or equal to mu of the closure, and because a is a mu continuous set, that's just mu of a. Similarly, mu n of a will be greater than or equal to mu n of the interior of a, since the interior of a is contained in a, and therefore the limb inf will be greater than or equal to the limb inf, which by part four is greater than or equal to mu of the interior of A. But since A is a mu continuous set, that's equal to mu of A. And so combining those two, what we see is that the limit as n goes to infinity of mu n of A is equal to mu of A as desired. And so to show all of the equivalences in the portmanteau theorem, it now suffices to show that this condition five, setwise convergence for mu continuous sets, implies the original definition of weak convergence in terms of integral testing against continuous bounded functions. Well, here's the idea of how to approach that. Take your test function f, which is continuous and bounded, and let's say that it's bounded above by b and below by a. Well then, f at x minus a, is the same thing as the Lebesgue measure of the interval from a up to f at x. Now we can do something which might look silly and write that as the integral from a up to f at x of dt. Or rather the integral from a up to b of the indicator of that interval from a up to f at x of t dt. 
Let's write that indicator in the following more suggestive way. It's the indicator of the set where f at x is bigger than or equal to t, dt. Now the reason to write it that way is that we can then write the thing we're interested in, the integral of f against mu n, like this, because mu n is a probability measure, and so the integral of a d mu n is just a. But that means we can write this as a double integral now, the integral over s of this inside integral. Now notice that the integrand is positive and measurable. It is easy to check that it satisfies all of the conditions of Tonelli's theorem due to the continuity of f. And so we will apply Tonelli's theorem and write this as such. But the inside integral is nothing other than the measure mu n of the set where f is greater than or equal to t. Now we can of course do exactly the same argument to write the integral of f against d mu as this. And so what we'd like to establish, which is that this integral converges to this integral, can be established so long as we show that this integrand converges almost surely to this integrand. That is, almost surely as a function of t with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Now what we know from our assumption 5 is that this does in fact hold true provided that the set f greater than or equal to t is a continuity set for mu. So this required almost everywhere convergence does hold except on the set of t's for which the mu measure of the boundary of that set is greater than zero. Well, the boundary of that set is contained in the set where f is equal to t. Why is that? Because f is continuous and the set where f is greater than t is therefore open and therefore contained in the interior of this set. And so we're looking for t's for which this set has positive mu measure. Well, here's the deal. That set is at most countably infinite. And that's because the measure of the whole measure space, S, which is one, and therefore finite, is the measure of the union of the sets where F equals T over all possible T's, because F is an everywhere defined function. But of course, those sets are disjoint for different T's. And so if there were an uncountable collection of sets here for which this had positive measure, this total measure would have to be infinite. So since this is a countable set, that means that this function of t converges to this function of t, except on a countable set of t's, which has Lebesgue measure zero. And therefore we do get that this integrand converges almost everywhere to this integrand. Since those functions are all bounded above by one, and we're integrating on a bounded interval by the dominated convergence theorem, we do conclude that this integral converges to this one, which concludes our proof of the portmanteau theorem. Next time, we'll continue to explore weak convergence and add some more conditions to the portmanteau theorem in the special case that we're most interested in, where our measures are measures on Euclidean spaces.